You've probably seen map animations before, be it in documentaries or YouTube videos, up to some of the biggest creators on this platform, like Johnny Harris, whose whole career is centered around doing amazing map animations. Have you ever wondered how they make these? Well, today's guest, Marcus Bergelt, is the man behind the tool that nearly all of these people use, Geolayers. Who invented the mapping tool that we use called Geolayers. It's a plugin for the video editing software Adobe After Effects. If you don't know anything about animation and video making, here's what you need to know to understand this conversation. Let's say I want to make a video on where all the listeners from this podcast are. I can sit in front of the camera and talk here, record the video and the audio, then need to bring all of that into a video editing software, line everything up, cut it how I want. Now, if I want to add an animation on top of where people are, I'll need a map or at least an image of a map and the data points I need, in this case where all of you are listening and watching from. Video editing is all about making things look nice, above all, so you can move images, add arrows, all that fancy stuff. But if you want a map, you also want to do all the things like reproject coordinates and show changes over time, line layers, in short, all the things that you'd use QGIS for. But video editing software doesn't really do that. And that's what GeoLayer is. It's the piece that sits on top of Adobe After Effects, the video editor, and handles all the map stuff for people who just want to make things animated and don't want to be professional cartographers. Okay, now that you've got the basics covered, the rest of what we talk about in this conversation won't be too surprising if you've listened to this podcast before, how Marcus got started doing all of this, and of course, what business model he's going for. Marcus is quite obsessed with lowering the barrier to entry to people making map animations because at the moment it's both really expensive and there's a high learning curve, take it from me who's tried doing it. And so he started a web app to simplify the process that leads us to a deep dive into the trade-offs of building web apps compared to downloadable software that people can install themselves. This is a fun one, I hope you'll enjoy it. This episode is sponsored by OpenCage. If you're building any application or tool that uses location data, at some point you'll probably need to convert place names or addresses into coordinates or coordinates back into place names. And this is where OpenCage comes in. They offer a worldwide, affordable, forward and reverse geocoding service that's easy to use. OpenCage builds on top of open data sources, which grants much more lenient licensing terms than alternatives like Google, allowing you to store the data as you want and even keep it after you stop being a customer. You can also display it on any map, all at a more affordable price. OpenCage handles all the complexity of dealing with the messiness of the real world and provides a simple to use API that allows you to focus on your use case. They have a generous free trial that you can use to get started with no credit card required, and they offer a clear upfront pricing with a cancel at any time, no questions asked policy. To learn more, head over to opencagedata.com. I'll have a link in the show notes. As a side note, OpenCage is also responsible for hosting the Geomob events, as well as the Geomob podcast, for which I'll also have links in the show notes. Thank you to OpenCage for once again being a sponsor and for their continuous support of the podcast. I don't know if you know, I like starting these conversations the same way every single time. I like asking people how they would describe themselves. So how would you describe yourself? From the work side, I would say I'm, I'm a motion designer that somehow stumbled upon software development and uh, kind of like fell in love with that. Um, on the personal side, I'm, uh, I like mountain biking, I like snowboarding, I like dogs, I like being in the nature, and yeah, I guess that would describe myself a bit. Motion designer that falls into software development. I'm sure we're going to talk about uh, the development of GeoLayers, which is what you've worked. Um, can I ask you the same thing? Like, if you're at a party or with family and you have to kind of explain what you're doing um, and specifically on the you know map making side how do you explain what geolayer is and like what you do as well in simple terms 
yeah, this is always pretty hard because, um, like, especially if you want to explain it to like my family, like my, my mother and my father, <laughs> because they're kind of old yet. And, um, I always say, like, if you watch TV, if you watch news and they've got a topic that's like, that has some geographical relation and they show a map, like when they, yeah, like they just show a map, maybe of the war in the Ukraine or something like that. The map that you see there that is moving, that is kind of animated. This is the things that are done with my tool, GeoLayers. I like that, especially the war in Ukraine, I feel like is given a lot of attention. I work with satellite images a lot, and it's been actually kind of interesting to be able to point to that as well, to say, hey, we've, we've got actually a lot of images of, of what happens there. So, okay, you have this tool that's able to make these animated maps, um, but you've also told me this is not your full-time job. This is not actually what you do. You're still a, a motion designer. So how did you go from, you know, I'm someone who makes maps, who animates maps, who tells these story to, I'm going to make my own tool to, to do that. That's a very different job. Well, I work at a TV station. So my day job is like being a motion designer and like doing real-time graphics and things like that at a TV station here in Germany. And I think it was about like eight years ago um, when we, we did like a lot of maps for, for news and for things like that. And we weren't just satisfied with the software that is on the market concerning this. And so we always thought like, man, you could do this better. We worked a lot with, um, Adobe After Effects to do like normal infographics stuff and normal, uh, animations. So like with normal, I mean like not map related, like just... <laughs> just infographics and animation and After Effects. And we thought, man, it would be so cool if you had like a panel inside After Effects and you could like leverage all the power of, of uh, After Effects as a tool, but um, have the possibility to like zoom in satellite imagery, like highlight countries and things like that and do, do all this. And this was when the idea for GeoBears was born. And then we, yeah, we just, we just, tried things we we went through the sdks that were there and we read the documentation and yeah we we just started building something and um now we are in version three and um the tool has kind of like matured and um yeah you can do a lot of cool things with it and Till the day now, I do animate maps at my day job, and I find it a lot more easy now. Who is we? Is it other people that you were working with at the at the TV station you're at? Yeah, and it, it's especially uh, Nico. So Nico is also working for GeoLayers. So he does a lot of like customer support and like ideas, and we we talk a lot about the product and how we shape it. So he's also um, a colleague at the TV station. Okay, so it's the two of you that are behind all of this, basically. Yeah. Uh, okay. You totally glanced over. I I want to go into the details. Like, if you did, you have any software development background before doing this? Like, because it's one thing to say, "Hey, this this tool sucks." It would be so much better if I had a better tool. It's something else to go ahead and actually do it. Um, I'm sure it turns out probably much harder than you anticipated. Um, yeah. Like, I, I want to get into the weeds of how that actually happened. How do you go from, okay, I'm a, I have this problem. I wish I had a better tool. Um, I'm not trained in making this tool, but I'm going to go ahead and figure it out. Um, so I am, I am a multimedia designer. So I did some web design before I started this. So I, I knew a, a tiny, tiny bit of JavaScript. And I um, actually, when I was a kid, when I was about 12 years old, I started programming. So I started getting in touch with programming pretty early. Um, and back then, it was a pretty weird thing called Dark Basic, which was kind of like a a basic like language, but you could um, it had some it had like a very basic game engine. Uh, inside, so you could you could program little three D games, and I was <laughs> I nerded out on that as a kid. Um, so that's why I I, I kind of like I I know how to think and how to sort of like uh, develop the things at that point. So I was 
super bad at it. <laughs> I didn't expect it to get that complicated, but um, I know a little uh, back then. I knew a little back then, and I it was enough to just get started. But I didn't start with uh, GeoLayers, so I did I did a very little um, little tool or little tools, um, especially around. I don't know. In animation, there's the concept of of easing motion. That means like if you start a motion, you don't start it like linear. You you let it start slowly and and let the animation flow. And um, yeah, to help you with these kinds of things, I created my first uh, little tool in in After Effects. And this this was how I how I learned the mechanics, how I learned uh, how this all works out. There's a lot of things I want. I'm curious about as well. If you want to show a map, you need some data somewhere. Mm -hmm. You need you need a map. <laughs> it's kind of obvious, but if you open something like uh, any uh, you know animation software, it basically gives you the tools, but it does, doesn't give you the raw materials. You go out in the world with a camera, and you take video. Uh, you record sounds. You do your B roll, like all of that stuff. Um, now, if you want to do a map. Most people, I think, don't really expect that, hey, I'm going to have to go get my own map data. Um, people are like, I just want to show a country. And, you know, there's Google Maps has a map. Why can't I just use that? So how do you solve that problem? Or like, how do you figure out a way to make it work for people who might, you know, have that animation background, but don't maybe know about the maps as well without bringing all the complexity of the world of map making if you start asking people? Where do you get your maps? The very first, um, on the first version of GeoLayers, at that time, um, Bing satellite imagery was free to use for broadcast. So this was they they changed their terms of view, I, uh, terms of use. I think probably a year ago or or just in that time, and this was like the map data we started with because it, like we worked at a TV station, the data was free to use for for TV and broadcast. And this was the very first um, thing we we brought into GeoLayers. But GeoLayers as a tool is like you can connect loads of other data sources. So it, it's not, or at that time, it was not opinionated about uh, what data you want to use. You could basically connect each um, tile server that you want to reach out. But like for, for a motion designer who just wants to hop in, it's like, map data map data licensing and and things like that is very very complicated so um, we just had this very basic layer which was the satellite layer of bing and um yeah you could use it right away and but geolayers is like geolayers does not include any map data right so you need something like a map box uh, integration yeah. or do you uh what about open street map more as a not directly in like imagery but as a as a layer this came in when like yeah in the later versions we we yeah went through that and um open street map is such an awesome great project and like loads of companies like stand on the shoulders of uh, open street map as we also do so for like if you want to highlight features and things like that now in geolayers um so if you search for a certain, a certain region or things like that, this data is pulled from uh, OpenStreetMap. Right. And Yeah, because you, you, you basically have a browser that's built in where you can say, hey, I don't know, Germany, and it pulls out the border of Germany and you just have it as a layer and you can, like, without having to painstakingly draw it. Or what I would do as someone who's more in the data science, I would go find a CSV file or a GeoJSON and I would just like remove everything and then I have the GeoJSON and I'd put it in something like a QGIS and it would be a nightmare. And you've simplified that because it just queries OpenStreetMap. Yeah. Yeah, it queries OpenStreetMap and Natural Earth as a data source. So you can also import Natural Earth. But you can um, with with Version three right now, you can also import GeoJSON, shapefiles, CSVs, and everything you want. For for the average motion design user of like geospatial things, uh, you need to you need to have an easy way to get them going, to get them started. 
And uh, yeah, we tried to make this as seamless as possible. And you, you also told me like you don't have uh, any uh, geospatial GIS background. I'm curious, like how was it uh, realizing you know all these problems? Now you talk about it in a way that seems like it's pretty fluent about just you know even map tile server is not a thing that you say if you've never <laughs> used maps. Um, like this means like okay you you've you know, dug into it. I'm curious how it was stumbling on that as well. Um, and, and how it was before as well. Like, is that something that was still abstracted away and you didn't realize that was a, a problem? Like you said, there was frustration with the previous tool. Uh, yeah, there was frustration with the previous tools and there were, the data was not very good. I don't want to like <laughs> hate about any software here, but um, yeah, like borders didn't line up and things like that. And it was, it was not fun working with it. But um, as we started GeoLayers, we just, we did it for fun. It was not like uh, this was, we, we didn't start it and planned out like a startup and we're going to do this, we're going to do this. We just, we just wrote like proofs of concept. We just gambled around with it and we found out and learned about Maptile servers and, and which ones are out there. So at this point, yeah, I had, <laughs> sounds like I, this was, totally off topic for me so i didn't have like the software development background i didn't have like the gis background um yeah but it we worked our way through i'd say so it it took a lot of time to get there it was just i was pretty passionate about the project because it was like a lot of fun and i discovered the beauty in maps so uh yeah and it's it's till now it's it's a passion project for me. I I love developing on it. I love with working with it. And yeah, we try to solve these issues for our users. There's one thing that you mentioned that uh, feels very. <laughs> I've been there, which is uh, you import borders and they just don't line up. And the first thing that comes to mind is when you want to make a map that's very easy to use for people. Um, you want to take care of projections you don't ever want to say hey there's what projection is your data in because you've lost everybody pretty much except the nerds yeah. who are like oh <laughs> um and so you know the web is pretty opinionated now and and most people are used to you you use something like a web mercator that's what that's the map projection that most people are are, are used to um is that something that you also realized hey we're gonna have to uh, abstract this away um so geolayers is geolayers now is based on web tech so it's only possible to have is it is it called mercator or yeah. mercator i think you pronounce it a bit different mercator i, I think mercator all right yeah i don't know <laughs> <laughs> so let's let's go with mercator uh geolayers internally uses uh web mercator projection it can project um, all the data that you import to um, Mercator. So things will line up if everything goes right. But you don't have like the, po the possibility to change the projection in the output. That's something we would love to do and a lot of users request, but it's technically pretty hard. Yeah, I can imagine. Um, so until then, we're going to have Greenland that's the size of Africa. <laughs> Yeah, we got some we got some workarounds in in After Effects that wraps this Mercator texture on a sphere. So right, yeah, and if you like, have the camera that's close enough, you it just still looks like a two D plane. Yeah, something like that. Yeah, this is so interesting because it's exactly the same problem that a lot of the companies that are doing web mapping have. Mm -hmm. Is I was talking to um, someone who who worked at Mapbox and how they've they basically switch projections on the fly. So if you mm -hmm. zoom out, it's a different projection. And then if you zoom in, it's Mercator because it preserves like um, right angles and things like that, like what people are used to. And it's like the amount of engineering that goes into hiding that and making it uh, like intuitive for people is insane. That's what I, that's, that's why I love so much about all this because it, it, it hides so much complexity. It's like just a normal uh, a map viewer on the web. It's like, it's such a complex thing. And you just browse it, 
and you zoom it and it's 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 fluent and it like seems like to work out of nowhere and it's there's so much tech in there it's very very interesting thing i i like a good uh, business model conversation and like talking about the the finances and things like that and you mentioned like you um you didn't go and do a startup uh you didn't go like oh this is a, a project we could raise some money we could start uh, now you also have a web app like geolayers is is like a web app so you can go without needing um after effects you can go ahead and start making map animations there and there's like a pretty nice ui there's a whole you know there's a pricing page like if you saw that you'd be like oh this is the latest startup that just raised the money and and started it, it i don't know if that's the direction that you ended up going in recently but it doesn't feel like it from from hearing you like this is just a side project that you're doing on the side whenever you have some time to solve your own problem um and yeah i'd, I'd love to dive into that a little bit more because it's such a stark contrast from a lot of what you hear that makes noise of like raising money and starting these big projects um is that something that ever crossed your mind and Yeah, I, I'm curious to know how you think about that. Actually, not. So we didn't raise any money from from anybody. Um, I mean, GeoLayers now is more than a side project for me. So I I do work less hours on my day job to have like more time to develop GeoLayers. And um, I'd say from version two to version three, it it uh, worked as a business. Um, we sold this. On kind of like an, an app store for After Effects plugins, which is called aescripts.com. And uh, yeah, Lloyd Alvarez, uh, partner, um, supporter from like the first day. I'm very thankful. Um, I am not good at business things and I am not <laughs> good at like marketing things. So he has helped a ton with that. And Yeah, also the web app is um yeah, it's it's like my passion project and it's something that I I just love doing and uh it's something that I developed. But of course, um at that point you needed like um get partners in because we can do like the map data side. So as a partner, we go with Map Tyler. Um They provide like the data, which is also based heavily on OpenStreetMap, but also on other data sources. And like the vision with Chillers is making map animation um, more approachable. So this is what we want to like. This is what we this we want to ease that process. And like a big thing as we as we just talked is. What map data is out there? What is the license of this map data? Can I use that for like commercial projects? Can I use it for this and that? And um, with the web app, we wanted to have like a very, like one plan you can, well, first of all, you can like try it out for free. And if you want to like export video and use it commercially, um, there are like paid plans, but we wanted to have like the data as well as the tool in like one spot it's like very easy licensing and this is what we're trying to do so i had to thought uh, i had to think about like business stuff there but but it's not like the typical um we're gonna fund this we do pitch decks and things like that so that's not how it evolved and it's still the two of you plus some partnerships now yeah exactly okay. so very very lean very small team basically that's And then you, you're doing all of it. Um, okay, that's that's. I, I love this. It's so interesting. It's kind of refreshing as well. <laughs> I I, I kind of like um, when I develop. Uh, one one principle um, for me is that I don't try to sell to solve problems that are not there yet. So you always need to you always need to um, think about this because you try to. There's a thing called uh, premature optimization in software development. It's when you when you think, oh well, this problem could happen, and I I guess I need a solution for that. And in the end, this leads to like making things overly complex because you assume something will happen that might never happen, and that might 
like make it very harder uh, in the end. And so, um, yeah, it's the same approach also with like, with like developing the web app. Why would I need funding? Why, why would I need that? I mean, I've come that far. I, I know the tech. It's, I love what I'm doing. Um, and it works out. So why would I, why would I change that model? I think, uh, there is a lot sometimes of this feeling that if I don't raise a ton of money, I can't start working on a project but a lot of the times it's just well you just need to start working on the project yeah. and then see how it goes um and especially if you if it's something you have a job on the side like you don't need this to really go anywhere if you're just having fun like it's it's great on its own yeah that's a, that's a big thing for me too and um well one point is that i also uh really love my day job so i i yeah love the contrast and i i love staying in touch with with kind of like my users so the users of geolayers so i i know how animation works and i know what sucks when you animate it so um i i feel the pain so i know where i need to like better things up um but also like it's it's a security thing like for me it feels more secure that i have this day job and if something with glairs uh, goes wrong i i still have the day job so i can yeah i i can like maybe take a little more risk on the glair side and uh, do it with less fear fear always is bad for decisions <laughs> it's, yeah it's you start good. getting desperate um i yeah. feel like there's a lot of value in in being your own user as well not just making the thing but using it i i'm sure that's where a lot of the improvements come from like there's no better like drive than hey this is really annoying let me go fix it <laughs> uh, rather than yeah. someone who says hey i tried your thing it was cool but this was a little annoying you can always say yeah sure i'll i'll do that later but when it's your own problem it's like no i i'm just gonna go solve that we i can imagine out. yeah yeah <laughs> yeah yeah i have to say that that this is this has become less so when we first started is this was like the bigger influence now um now it's more like user feedback that we kind of like develop features on. Um, yeah, but still there's some there's some quirks when I work with it where I think, oh man, we gotta better this up. So it's it's still there. The place where I heard first of GeoLayers isn't through TV, it's through YouTube a lot. Um there's an explosion of like people explaining stuff. I think at the tip of that sphere you have someone like a Johnny Harris. Uh, which is just massive. We're recording this. I think he just passed 5 million subscribers. Like this really big uh, thing. And then there's this really long tail of people who are doing, uh, just explaining things with Map because it's way more accessible as well. Um, and uh, Johnny Harris uses uh, GeoLayers, like he's, he's mentioned multiple times. You were in one of his, you did like a small cameo in one of his videos recently. I'm curious is like how is that seeing that like people you know you you come from this uh tv station which i think things are probably very professional like people have been doing this for a long time tv's been around for a long time uh, and then you have people in their bedrooms that are like cool i can start doing this and explaining a bunch of stuff uh, that's a very different type of people but at the end you're still making maps and explaining things with people uh, to, to people sorry i'm so honored that that all this went up and that like creators like johnny harris use geolayers and um like reach out to me and um yeah we have conversations on little topics that he wants so he uh the thing you just mentioned he sent over a data set and, and said like hey can we use this in geolayers and they uh i recorded a little screencast and um transformed the data a bit for him and yeah i'm i'm very honored um that uh, geolayers went this way, and probably that geolayers is a little, a little reason that um, making making map videos is more approachable for more users, and so more, like I'd say, uh, little creators as well as big creators on YouTube um, can do these kind of animations. So this is, I'm also kind of a bit proud of. Yeah, so I can imagine. I, Are, do you have any any favorite ones like? where um you, 
you've just seen people do things that either surprised you um, or you thought were just really cool? Um, anything that comes to mind? Johnny Harris, um, Sam Ellis, Search Party is very, very great explainers with maps. Um, yeah, basically it started, those are like the Vox, the Vox guys, I would say. There was like series Vox Atlas or Vox Borders that Johnny did. Um, yeah, those are like, in my opinion, like the top. Do you get feedback from them on like what they want to do? I mean, that that video that you mentioned on um, the, like he sent you some data, like a, I was quite surprised that the, for some context, it's a video around um, how much the U.S. exports in, in military equipment. And a lot of the, a good chunk of the video is on creating this data set. And th this was really interesting for me to see because it's like we we put a lot of effort into putting this data set and then trying to figure out a way to map it. And th this is where you come in. Um, and it, it kind of felt like seeing a little bit behind the curtain. Uh, and so it was an interesting narrative uh arc to go for that um but i'm curious do you get uh you know feedback from them or like hey we'd like to do this project um can we make it easier to i don't know some something as simple as i have a csv uh with coordinates um and i need a way to put that on a map it, it's not that obvious if you don't really know how to do it um, so yeah, I'm, I'm curious how those dynamics and, and those relationships go. So it's not that like for, for every series he does, he reaches out, but, um, if he has like problems to solve, he, he reaches out and, um, yeah, some, some features and some things inside of GLairs are there because of like the feedback of uh, Johnny and his team. So yeah, we all. We, from time to time, we hop on a call with also the video editors and um, explaining some things and they got like questions, how to do this best, how to do that best. And yeah, I'm trying to trying to support this as I like really, really love what they're doing. It's uh, it's awesome. Do you see yourself? Um, I mean, it, it doesn't seem like it, but I, I feel like do you see yourself doing more of like a support? In, in that sense, like I could totally see someone as well going in, hey, I'm going to have this um, software. This is really common in the open source software side where you have this open source project and the way a company makes money or the people behind it is they offer support and you have to pay for that. Um, does that is that something that you've ever thought of doing? It's not, you know, open source software in a way, but it's a little bit the same thing of, hey, you have, you're using this thing um, and I'm going to help you make the most of it. Um. It's not to a certain degree. I mean, I, I love helping out and I, I love doing this, but I would not uh, do this full time. So I'm very like passionate about building these systems and like developing the things and designing the UIs and, and things like that. So this is, this is the work I really love doing so yeah i will focus on that and for like the support side of the things like technical support and um things that every user uh, might stumble upon um nico takes care of like a lot of this i think uh i i really appreciate you mentioning that that the way you're talking about seems to be really fueled but what do you actually like spending your time doing and not like how big can this become or how how much can we grow this it's just like what do you like doing of your day like what is the actual work that you like doing and it's just optimizing and and just making sure that that's what you're doing and not uh making this as big as you can because you'd end up working on things that you don't actually like doing <laughs> hmm I just uh, that might might sound a bit naive and blue eyed, but I build a lot. I mean, we have if I if I sit down with Nico, uh, we talk about the future and what we could do. We talk about like the vision and and what goals we could we could set. But most of my time, I I build. I got like well, you get a little Kanban board where where like the team can throw in some feature requests and things like that, and then. Then I sort these things out and I build most of the time. And I do write emails with partners <laughs> and 
like this cause <laughs> pricing and licensing and things like that. There's this no is, way around that, is there? Yeah, there's no way around that. This is not what I like love doing, but uh, yeah, you got to do it. And it's it's fine. It's it's not it's not overwhelming. So it's not uh, most of the time. Most of the time, I can build, and uh, that's very very fun for me. Let's. Uh, I, I want to go into the web app a little bit. Um, when you told me about that, I was actually quite surprised because it feels like this is a different category of of project. Uh, it's one thing to make a, a plugin. I mean, it's already a big lift to make a plugin for for a software that already exists. It's a whole other one to say we're going to make a web app that's completely standalone. Um, so now you have to build an entire backend. You have to have a front end. Like you have to think about uh, deploying this and making sure that it's fast and responsive. And you're also loading a lot of data. Like it's a very different project. What made you? <laughs> Say, hey, you know what? Um, we could make a web app out of this. This might be this might be a bit embarrassing now, but <laughs> I'm going to tell you the story. So, um, first of all, we we of course a uh, GLS three, which is like the After Effects extension, is two to three years old now, I guess. So, normally it would be the time to like build GLS four. And um, there is there is sort of like a platform inside of Adobe or inside of uh, Adobe After Effects that you build those plugins or those extensions on, and they want to overhaul this. So they want they want to renew this. They want to build a new platform. So they they said that they will do this this about two years ago, I guess, and um, they gave some technical details, and I started building little UI components for this new platform. And till now, this platform is not, unfortunately, it's not in After Effects. So it took longer as they planned. And I was like, I was building UI components. And I, I built like little sliders, little triggers, little little things that could fiddle around with numbers. And then I, I started building like the feature browser and then I started like building a preview for certain styles that you could like, uh, you can, in GLRs, there's a concept of data-driven styles, which is like super normal for GIS guys, but which is like for, for motion designers, a big thing. So you could take a data set and um, um, depending on the data of a feature inside the set, you could like switch a color or, or extrude something or things like that. And I always wanted to have like a real time preview. So I built that real time preview on the web and, um, yeah, things came together and like the, the development of the platform and Adobe site took longer as expected. And then there came the point where I had like, well, I've got like all these components that work seamlessly on the web. Um, let's throw them together and, um, build this kind of web app. And yeah, it it went out that the tech nowadays is there. So, I mean, uh, GLR stands on like the shoulders of giants. There is like, it stands on um, Mad Libre now, which is an open source project, which is like the, the renderer for the maps. Um, a lot of work for this has been done by Mapbox that you just mentioned. Um, yeah, we, we have like, map tiler as a data provider which is also like yeah a lot of work that we couldn't do ourselves um yeah but this is this is how it evolves and this this was the time when i think when i thought yeah let's let's do the web app let's let's try it out let's let's see where it goes and there is um and there's one thing um that is a bit more strategic in this i guess so Make, making map animation more approachable, right? This is the vision. And um, Adobe After Effects is still complex software. So it's not like not every video creator knows how to animate, how to fiddle around with keyframes, how to like value graphs and, and easing what I just said. It's, it's a complex software. And we had a couple of users that like Googled um, create map animations. Then they find geolayers, 
then I find out, okay, GeoLayers is a plugin for After Effects. So I got to learn After Effects. And this is like, this is, a, it's complex. It's a hard thing. So we wanted to make this easier and we, we want to create also, um, like plugins or extensions for, uh, video editing software like Adobe Premiere or DaVinci Resolve, which is like a little bit more approachable. And um, to do that, you need you need a lot more tech on the plugin side, as if you would need for like Adobe After Effects. In Adobe After Effects, there's like a lot of complexity on the on the After Effects on the host side, I would say. Um, and for doing it in like cut or video editing software like DaVinci Resolve or Premiere, it's yeah, more work needs to be done um, on the plugin side. And yeah, if you have a web app that does like pretty much all, you can take the components of that and and throw it inside of an integration in, in other software and hopefully get this to work. If I were to summarize, what I'm hearing is a frustration on the Adobe side that they didn't figure out their own uh, platform and you were just tinkering around with it anyways. I wouldn't say frustration. I mean, in the end, it, in the end, this is the reason why we have the web app now. And I wasn't, I wasn't, I wasn't that frustrated. I mean, you can't, I, uh, don't be worried about things that you can't change. I mean, you could, you could push so much, um, like so much hate into this and you could like think about it and ah, why isn't it that way and things like that. But that in the end, this is like, this doesn't make sense. So you could, you could use your energy, you could use the time you have for other things. And this is uh, what I tried doing and um, yeah, went out well. So it was, I'm, I'm not, uh, I, I got to say, um, I'm also in, in touch with the Adobe team for After Effects and they're pretty supportive. So I've not, I, <laughs> I have absolutely no hate for them. So no, I didn't mean frustration in, in the sense of like, you know, you're raging and throwing your, your keyboard out the window. <laughs> I, I just mean in... Uh... <laughs> Yeah. And not being necessarily able to to build what you need, like not having the, the platform that you need to build what you want to be able to build. And so starting to look elsewhere in, in a, what seems like a very problem solving approach, like, hey, this is the the terrain has changed. I need to go figure this out somewhere else. And then and then starting. Um, I uh, I definitely resonate with what you mean on like making lowering the barrier to, to entry um, I think there's the technical side but I also think there's a cost side uh, to um, Adobe specifically if you want to work with anything Adobe there's a very pricey subscription and that's as far as I know the only way to be able to work with their tools and so uh, like I, I'm, I tinker around with animating. I've started making some videos. I did some animations for some of the intros of this podcast on on YouTube. Um, and very quickly, I just decided I'm not going to invest my time learning in Adobe because it's just really expensive, and that is something I'm going to have to start paying for all the time if I want to start using it. And then you have something like a, a DaVinci Resolve, which is it's free for 90% of the features, first of all. And then if, you, if you're if you serious, it's it's a one-time 300 um, payment. And, uh, you know, up for just a few versions, and that's what Adobe would say. It's like, hey, you, you never have to worry about updates because uh, you'll just have it forever. But it means that the barrier to entry is also really, really uh, high. And so I don't know if that's something that you've considered. I think you, you you told me that was also one of the reasons. But now you can do um, mapping and in pretty cool animations for a much lower entry fee in a way because you could still. Um, I mean, your GeoLayers app is is a is a paid uh, tool, but if you use something like a DaVinci Resolve and you use a free version, now you can make an entire video for much much cheaper and i'm guessing not just the the tool but the pricing like those two things 
make it probably a lot easier for a lot more people to just start tinkering around. Yeah, we had users that said like, when when do you bring out like an extension for DaVinci Resolve? When can we go away from from Adobe? And um, yeah, yeah, I hear you on this. I always uh, I I am an Adobe user and I, I pay my subscription and um, I think a bit different on this because okay. I I think um, for what for what you get it's the price is okay so if you but but it depends so if you're like a motion designer that does like all your income comes from things that you create with these tools it's totally fine so for i th i think like that because if if you think like if you're a craftsman you got to buy tools you got to buy a car you got to buy things like that and like as a motion designer you need to have like a computer and you need to have software and if you make money with it it's kind of like okay but it's absolutely way way too expensive for hobbyists and for for yeah like for if you not make a lot of money with it like it doesn't make sense to pay pay such a high fee so i absolutely hear um people and um yeah the vinci resolve is yeah it's it's very great software it's like it's awesome that they they put it out for free and um yeah we hope to we hope to integrate with it a bit more in the future i uh i definitely hear you on that i think uh there's often a, a tendency of people devaluing especially software and, and having these expectations of um you know we were talking about people who raise money and, and and starting projects like there is sometimes a push for like just grow so just put it out for free and we'll figure out how we make money later and that creates this perverse expectations in a way that like software shouldn't cost anything it should just be free it should just work um, I mean, like Google Maps, like you never paid, like it's kind of hilarious to even think about paying for Google <laughs> Maps. But the yeah. amount of engineering that goes behind is is just ridiculous. It costs probably, you know, billions, if not tens of billions to, to make. Um, so I definitely hear you on that. And uh, I, I think it's good to have those expectations. I also see my own path and the, the way I got into um, like most of actually what I do today, which is um, I'm a data scientist, so I, I, you know, work with writing code a lot to process uh, satellite images. I am now doing this podcast. I make videos on the side. All of these things are nothing that I studied. And um, I, I studied uh, mechanical engineering, so I learned a lot about physics and math um, and just hunkering down and working. Like, all of these things are very useful skills, but the... The actual uh, skills in like programming or video editing, um, those are things that were possible because the tools were so easily uh, accessible. And I, I think because of that, I have this skew towards how can we make this easier for a bunch of people to just try out, and then definitely like you know if you're if you're depending if you're making some money, I think it's important to make sure that these things can be sustainable. And the best way to do that is to pay for them as well. Um, so I'm, uh, I'm also excited that there's starting to be more tools that are at different price points, meaning that like you can have just people in their bedroom trying it out. Um, I think that's, that's pretty cool. That gets me quite excited that there are more tools as well. I think that do different job um, back to, you know, if you're, if you're a, I don't know, a carpenter, I forgot what you mentioned, but it's nice that there are the the heavy duty tools, but I think there's also just nice that people can start around crafting their own little things uh, on their side. Um, and also Adobe has just not had some very nice practices uh, sometimes. <laughs> <Yeah>. And <laughs> But that's an entirely different uh, conversation. <laughs> I, I, I also, I'm not, I'm not, I don't have enough information to like have a strong opinion. On yeah, this, of course. Like, yeah, you, big corporations. It's yeah. it's the same with all of them. <laughs> There's something about we're gonna make a, a web app. We're gonna you know make it a little bit easier. Um, but you mentioned there's a high barrier to entry on the technical side, and I want to come back to that because I feel like making something simple 
is really hard. And so, um, you know, we talked about this for like projections. If, if people don't have to think about it, it's that a bunch of people have put a lot of work in making it very easy and very intuitive. Um, now it seems like you have to figure out a bunch of things. How do I make animating map? And, um, you know, you talked about easing. Like, how do I make that seamless without having to explain what a keyframe is and why you need to do it? And um, what a spline is and like all these things that like that's what you start learning if you do animation that like okay you have to fade things in and fade them out and how much do you want to do this and there's sliders everywhere um it seems like now you have to have a sort of vision on how uh do i make this simpler and you have to start being opinionated on having defaults and what what controls am i going to give people and what am I going to take away? I'd be really curious as to how you start making those decisions. Uh, that's probably one of the hardest parts. And this is something that you, that you need to know or that you want to know very early in the project. Um, and once you start it, there's like no way back. If everybody says, oh yeah, but come on, give us keyframes. That's, <laughs> that's not nice what you did here. Then you have a big problem. But um, I try, and this is very hard for me, but I try, I try to imagine how I would love to work or what I try to imagine how, how the thing would look um, for me to like get my work done quicker or like selecting key. If you want to, if you want to retime an animation in like After Effects, like even if it's just a zoom from one place to another place you need to like i don't know it's it's hard to explain for people who don't who don't use after effects but you need to twirl down properties you need to select keyframes that there's a keyframe for the start of the animation there's a keyframe for the end of the animation you need to select them but don't select others and move them in time and this is this can get quirky and just because uh, you want to change some timing and um the basic concept uh, behind the timeline and how it works in um, in the web app, which should be way more accessible, um, is you could you could look at a map view as if it was footage. If you have like video editing and um, you have footage of this place, and afterwards you have a piece of footage of this place, then you you have a timeline, you have a duration for this footage, and you can just drag them together. And GeoLayers does like the transition between those. So um, a lot of a lot of like animators that use it the first time that come from After Effects and that come from the the keyframey background, they are like they're like what is this? I mean, that's that's kind of weird. That's kind of weird to work with um, because they're like so used um, to all the keyframe things. But once they once they wrap their head around it, they say like, oh yeah, makes sense. Makes sense because it's 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 easier to get if you don't have an if you don't have an, an experience in animation or if you don't have learned that way and. Um, for I hope for for video editors they can see like the parallels in like the timeline. So it, it's it's hard and um, yeah it might it might still be the wrong decision. I don't know. We have to find out if people like it or not. Yeah, and then you also I'm guessing we mentioned earlier like you were you're a user of your own tool now it's probably a little different because you're trying to make something for someone that doesn't have as much knowledge as you do so you can't test it and and as much um that's that's probably quite different as well it's it's very hard because um if you develop like your ui you see it every day you see it for hours every day everything seems like for you everything's like nice this is the way how it should be so um yeah of course we need to have like users we need to have user feedback we need to nico is, is always pretty pretty critical on things so this is very valuable so i i say like oh yeah i got that new feature come on check it out and he says like hmm, 
yeah, but you know, why isn't it that way? Why is it that way? <laughs> and for me, that's it's good. like that's nice it's, to it's have, a, probably. Yeah, it's a bummer at at first sight, but it's super valuable. It's like the view from outside is is um, very very important. So we always we always try to collect um, feedback from users and and work on a basis of this this feedback. There are two projects that come to mind. Uh, I'm I'm curious to know if you've heard about them or or, or keep uh, an eye on on them. The first one is on uh, the mapping side, which is Felt. Mm-hmm. I don't know if you've heard about them. Mm-hmm. Um, they're not on the animation side, but they're trying to make map making, I guess, but also sharing maps collaborative in the browser and a lot simpler. So they want to be something like a Notion or a Google Docs, but for maps. And so um, part of why I think about it is because they're rethinking a lot of the UI on the mapping side. What does it mean to... uh, Yeah, so they've thought, for example, of like, if you have a CSV with just city names, if you drag and drop it in, that it should figure out, you know, that those are city names, even if the column doesn't say city name, um, but it doesn't even have a header. So there's a lot of engineering that happens in the back. They're, they're working on making it fast. Um, and the second project is uh, Procreate Dreams. I don't know if you have heard about that. Um, Procreate is a drawing app on iPad. And they just came out with another app like a few months ago. I think it came out in February, uh, which is a video animating app on iPad. And they have... um, The history of Procreate is really interesting. They started, like I think, more than a decade ago um, when the iPad came out and they realized... So they were... um, Yeah... They, they drew a lot and they realized like a lot of the tools were pretty clunky, required heavy duty software that you plug, like a tablet that you plugged into your computer. You needed something like a Photoshop, like these really heavy tools. And they were like, now we have this tablet and Apple made a pen with it. Why don't we make a drawing app that's a lot easier? Um, and so fast forward 10 years ago, 10 years now, um, they are trying to do the same thing with uh, video and specifically frame by frame animation. So, like that's the old school Disney. Um, you know, people you draw one um, a character, you go to the next frame or like a couple frames later, and you draw it again. Um, and what they want to do is a little bit the same thing as saying, "Okay, we've made drawing a lot easier and a lot more approachable." Uh, for professional artists, but also for hobbyists. Can we do the same thing for video? Uh, And it's been very interesting to hear them talk. There's a bunch of interviews on like how they made the UI um, because now the entire video editing UI needs to fit on an iPad that you can move around with your finger. Uh, If anybody has ever opened up a video editing software, there's buttons (laughs) everywhere and sliders (laughs) everywhere. Um, and so what I'm hearing is what you're trying to do, uh, is a mix of both of those projects at the same time of it's in the browser. It's really easy. And it's also making animation uh, a lot easier. Um, and so, yeah, that's first thing it makes me think of those are, have you heard about them? And do you look out at what other projects are doing and how they're trying to, figure out their own UI or um, their their own trade-offs? So I, I look a bit around. I'm not too desperate on this, so I'm not I'm not doing it that much. But of course, if somebody sends me, hey, look at this, I, I try to gamble around with it and see how, how they solve certain problems. Um, I know Felt, um, and I think it's a great piece of software, and it does, I think, a very great job at making super complex things look very very easy on the surface so like just what you said the they they got this upload anything um button or this upload anything function that you can just throw any any file format in and they they are trying to figure out um and bring it into geographical context it's um yeah it's pretty nice and a lot of tech behind this that users might not might not see for first place so yeah 
I, I really like the product and um, the other one, Procreate, I, I think I have watched a couple of um, like YouTube videos and on things like that, but I didn't know the, the video animator that they just brought yeah, out. Yeah, Dreams. Procreate Dreams. dreams. Um, and it's like it's the, the, the technique with like animation, the animating frame by frame is like onion skinning. It's yeah, named exactly. onion skinning, so they've, I guess. Yeah. They've uh, they've actually reinvented uh, the main core engine behind uh, Procreate. So the drawing, you can tell it's still behind. Like it's really missing some some basic drawing features. Um, but they have onion skinning, which is uh, for people who are not familiar, because this is starting to get very far away from from maps. Is uh, <laughs> um, basically you you see the uh, image that you're drawing, and then. If you do another one, it there's a, a transparency layer. So you can start seeing the previous frames. If you're drawing a character or if you're moving an object around, you can see where it was before. Um, they're doing that, but they're also doing... Um, you can import uh, videos and you can import um, images and sound. And one of their like just genius uh, things, I, I think is they have this uh, record me, I think it's called. I forget what the name is. Basically, you you bring in an image. Um, so this is really cool for mapping as well, I think. You could have like a Mac base layer and you could have, say you want uh, to draw a plane that's you know flying from one plane to the other on your map. Um, so you can bring a, a, an image, a JPEG of a plane. And instead of uh, you know keyframing it, like this is where it is, uh, drawing like your line of where it has to go and keyframing it, doing the easing in and easing out, like all of what you would have to do for an animation. They're like, well, we're on an iPad. Just press record and just drag it where you want. And then bam, it figures out everything. And it's like, oh, this is, it's so obvious in hindsight. Um, it's still a little clunky on, on some of the implementations, um, but you can stack that. You're like, okay, first you can move it, then you can go back, and all you're gonna do is uh, zoom in and zoom out, so that you know if you go up, it's like the plane is going higher, so you're gonna uh, zoom out a little bit or zoom in, so the plane looks bigger. Um, but it still has the the first uh, track that you've done before. Their um, intro animation, they they show it with an eagle that's flying around, and it looks incredibly smooth and natural because someone didn't have to draw the entire line and like Bezier curves and stuff. It's just someone on their iPad and they're just like moving it around with their finger and it's like mind blowing. Um, and I'm sure there's an enormous amount of work and um, making a simple UI like this is, is probably ridiculously hard. Um, but, but I think they're doing some really cool innovation uh, and thinking on how do you make video uh animating and video editing a lot uh simpler on that end yeah this is like a great example for thinking outside the box right if you're like a 10-year animator you might not even be it might not even be possible for you to think in this way right so that this i mean it sounds obvious if you if you talk about it yeah of course you have an ipad of course you don't need like tinker around with keyframes you can just draw your animation like that's it it seems kind of obvious as we talk about it but to come up with it and to make it make this feature uh or, or implement it in a way that it's uh, that's really accessible and that's really working is a, a very a very hard thing and requires a lot of work um yeah we uh we also discussed this so we when we made the web app we we thought about all right is it already the time to make this all like just for touch devices or like touch device first but i think um i think for geolayers it would it would not yet work out to have it just um like a touch a touch ui so first of all it makes the development very harder because if we say like we want to use the UI components from the web app also in like an extension for After Effects, After Effects won't work with touch devices. So, um, so I would basically need to rebuild a lot of the components. They do have a little touch support, 
right now, um, but the whole UI is not made for like a touch device. So we decided against this because of um, our users, um, yeah, tend to plus geo layers work with video editing software. And at the point now, video editing software is not there to have it like run on touch devices. Yeah, that's uh, that's quite interesting. That's a bit of a problem that the Procreate Dreams team is having is um, you, you actually want to have some sort of granularity um, and then like uh, you end up bringing things in and out of your video editor. Um, I, I've used it a little bit to do um, really basic animations, like previews of animations that I want to make. It's a bit of a convoluted workflow, um, but I feel like these are the things that are going to be figured out over the next uh, few years. Um, so if we, uh, I also like asking people, let's say, let's let's try to predict the future a little bit. Like what are, what would you be really excited that, um, geo layers or, or any other thing would be able any other software you know around map making animation what kind of stories would you like to be able to to tell that you feel like you can't quite do because the the tools don't really allow at the moment and i realize that might be a bit of a tricky question when you're you know day in and day out in the tools and so you start thinking and being shaped by the tools that you have but do you have some project or some idea that you've been having in the back of your head for a little while and you're like ah i i don't quite know how to do that yet with the tools that we have today that that's super boring but uh you mentioned projections <laughs> that's like the worst boring answer i could give but um i want to have different projections in geolers and like as i as i said the vision for geolers is to make it more approachable so um at the point now, I would love to, um, yeah, focus more on building on the web because I think uh, a lot of software will move to the web. Video editing is probably one of the later ones because it's like loads of data is involved and you need to upload things and download things. So that makes video editing a bit harder than like, um, image editing like Figma or or things like that. This is like, this is awesome. There's like no downsides having this on the web. It's just upsides. It's you can collaborative uh, collaborative work is possible there, and it's it's a perfect example. And I think software will move to the web in like a couple of years. I don't know. I don't know when. But it I'm will. gonna push back on that. I okay. think there's one big, for me at least, personally, um, I don't like stuff on the web as much. Um, and there's one giant uh, downside for me is that um, I don't own anything anymore. And mm -hmm. the um, that, that might sound like a you know, like a grumpy old man thing to say a little bit and like, it doesn't matter. Um, and I, I think it really does because I feel like um, there's, uh, you're giving a, a lot of control in a way and whoever maintains the the web app, um, you know, you need to have servers that keep running. There's an ongoing cost to, to keeping these things uh, going on for a while. I think uh, for me, there's a bit of a cautionary tale in the video streaming world, for example, where there was this promise of, hey, you won't need to have a DVD collection at home. You can have everything on the web. That is until you don't have, you know, Netflix doesn't have the rights to the movie because they only licensed it for a few years. Um, and so you could say, okay, it's not really the software, it's the the, the movies in and of themselves. Um, that might not happen for, for um, tools and things like that. Um, but it's, I think, quite the same thing. Like now you're giving your control over tools to someone that can kind of change them uh, whenever they want. Like websites are incredibly uh, dynamic. They change all the time. The UI changes all the time. If you go from uh, software where there's there's new versions that come out, 
um, you can decide when you update to the new version. Like, I need this project. You know, the next six months, I'm going to be really working on projects. I really don't need my UI to change. Um, but once this project is finished, I can invest a little bit of time to learn the, the new UI of the new version of, of this software. Um, and now when you're working on a web app, uh, you just log in one day and things have moved around. Uh, <laughs> because what you're doing is you're saying, hey, you type your URL and you're saying like, send me over to this part of the internet and check out what they're, they're doing there. Um, and so maybe this is, you know, having uh, learned a lot of what I do on, on open source and uh, open data and things like that. Um, I, I tend to be quite cautious of the uh, benefits of, of web. Um, there's like you mentioned Figma, there's more and more things that are trying to do uh, 3D modeling as well. I'm a, my favorite piece of software, I think probably ever is Blender. Um, because of how good it is, but also because they've been able to pull off this incredible feat of making money while being free. And like, it's not free asterisk uh, for the free version. It's no, 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 no. The entire thing is just free. And they still make money because people are like, this is incredible. Please keep making this. Um, and if there's a new version, like you decide when you want to up great versions of blender um and you you control like that software like that's that's on the other extreme end of like the 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 scale of how to make software and what decisions to make um but i i see that um as as a big um that's for me i know a big hurdle when someone's like we're going to start using this thing that's only web I'm like, ah, I don't know if I if I want that because are you guys going to be around in 10 years? And is it going to be worth learning something that that might disappear? Um, you know, that that might turn into the uh, premature optimization problem that you were mentioning of like, is it worth it? Um, you know, is, you know, things are going to change so much by then that maybe it's not that big of a deal. Uh, but this is a, a whole bunch of, of things. I just wanted to push back on that and provide a bit of a different perspective. Yeah, it's an interesting take. It's like, um, this is also what we hear a lot from um, enterprise environments, like where they just they just need to like stay safe. <laughs> they want to buy their things. They want the cost to be like planable over like the next five to 10 years and things like that. So um yeah, completely understand that, and um, but I by, but I think what happens on the web is that the super complex things like Blender or like I don't know business software, um, I think this is the way to go that you just mentioned. But I believe that on the web, a lot of tools for end users will appear and will make it like super easy to hop in. You have like no installation or things like that. These things are always up to date. And um, I think, my opinion, for the end user, this is what counts. So I I, I believe. So there there might be a split, but... And, and what you see is Blender can do like everything. If you look at the web apps that now appear, that the... the the problem domain is like a lot more narrow. You have like you have you have tailored apps for every problem, and this is. I feel this is a bit of the the trend where it where it's moving. So yeah, we'll, yeah, yeah. we'll I, find I, out. But I but I, that's just my personal opinion. No, no, no. But that's like, why I I I appreciate uh, that, and I think there's different tools. Like Blender is also just really hard to get into at first mm -hmm. like the first time you open it up you're like what am i doing with my life <laughs> like why <laughs> um then you have something like uh what is it uh, sketchup i think which is something that got acquired by google like that i don't know if that's still around but it was um it probably is in the web or if they would start something like that it would be a web app now like much simpler tools to make 3d modeling um so yeah, I'm I'm excited that people are trying new stuff. 
uh, as well. Like that, that's just really cool. And I think there is value in saying like, all you need is a, is a much cheaper laptop as well. Like that's what you get with having things on the web. Um, it, it's lowering the barrier to entry a, a lot more and, and, you know, it can be a gateway to other stuff. Um, but yeah, I'm excited to see where all these things go and, and like how these bets and gambles, uh, go so do you um to kind of wrap up on there do you do you foresee like all of your development time going towards the web app or um also these plugins for for video editors yeah no not not everything will go into the web app i think um well by now most of our users are using the after effects extension and um you have like the web app has, of course, downsides. So you don't have that much creative freedom. You don't have uh, that much control over your animations as you would have in, in After Effects. So definitely there's uh, a need um, and users that want the, the After Effects site or the, the site on like other video editors to, to be maintained and to, to get updates. And we will do that. Um, yeah. And the web app is like, as we just talked, it's like lowering the, the entry barrier and like bring people in. And, and if they, if they try it out and, and see how it works out and they say, oh, well, but I need to like do this a bit different and this a bit different, then they might try out an, an integration in another program. So the After Effects extension or something like that. You are not online very much. You're not very visible <laughs> online. Yeah. Like you're kind of a bit of a ghost. <laughs> well, except not anymore now that, you know, there's a pretty long conversation with you and you out there. <laughs> um, but the, the reason I say that is how do you go about getting people to know about what you're doing and what you're making? Like, how do you go about marketing? I'm sure making a web app doesn't come cheap. And so you, you know, probably want people to know about it. How do you go about getting people to care and to pay attention to, to what you're doing? I am very not good at this. So <laughs> I'm, <laughs> I'm dependent on like, like marketing and like building up followers and things like that for, and building up a user base for um, the After Effects extension was almost everything done by AE scripts. So they they do this, which is the, the, the platform that, where which is like the platform that sells, yeah. that sells it. And um, for the uh, for the web app right now, we are in in open beta, so we don't spread the word too much right now. Um, yeah, we'll we'll have to figure it out. I <laughs> I kind of like push these tasks to Nico a bit, <laughs> and. Um, I am not a person that is very comfortable in front of a camera or like in front of a big audience. I'm like, I'm like more of the guy in the background. So that's, that's where I'm more comfortable in. And um, yeah, I try to like things that I just can't do good. I try to ask other people to help me. Like also we have um, Jason Boone, which you also had on the podcast, who's like, um, yeah, who's supporting GLayers, who is like creating tutorials for it. And and yeah, he's got like an affiliate deal with um with AE scripts. So when when his user base or or his viewers buy something, he will get a cut on that. So it's a it's a cool partnership, a win-win for both. And um yeah, we would do do things like that, I guess. So we would do probably some affiliate marketing if if they like the tool, I always, I always say like, but you gotta like the tool, man. If you if you just if you just say something and and in the end you don't use it, I I don't like it. I it needs to be like authentic. And with with Jason, he, well, from what I can tell, uh, what I can tell, he he loves working with G layers and he loves like tinkering around with the maps. And um, he's yeah, an awesome partner in this concerning this. Yeah, it was really cool talking to Jason as well and, and hearing his background. I, I love talking to people who like accidentally stumble on maps and like figure out you can do cool things with it and, and come at it with very different perspectives and, and points of view. Um, 
I, I feel like I have a little bit of a story like that. And I think one of some of the coolest and most interesting ideas come from people that thought the current way things are done are just too complicated. And let's just naively try to do something. How hard can it be? Um, and sometimes it, you know, falls on its head terribly. Um, and sometimes you get really cool stuff uh, coming out of it. And you will, you will, you will have little failure on the way. I mean, that's like. Do you have a Do you have an idea of when you guys would launch the the app um, out of public beta? So it's yeah, it's public beta. You can try it out right now, mm -hmm. um, but no date yet. We we have a couple of features that we want to implement on the list, and as soon as we have figured this out, right. um, I love that as well. Like just uh, whenever it's ready. <laughs> I mean, there's there's actually no downside. So it's it's open beta. It's, we have like reduced pricing. You can just hop in. I have links to that for people who want to try it out. Uh, I tried it out. It's like it is like shockingly easy to just make a map animation. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> That's what I wanted to hear. <laughs> <laughs> I encourage people to to go check it out and tr and try it out. Like I I think like you can make a uh, what is it? A ten-second video uh, on the on the free plan, just very easily. Um, I think this is starts to be a, a nice place to start rounding the conversation off. Um, I like rounding these off, asking for a book and a podcast recommendation. Uh, if you if you read and and listen to to podcasts, um, there's a couple of reasons I like to do that. The first one is uh, they travel a lot through word of mouth. Um, a lot of how I hear about books are because people tell me they're pretty cool um and like i should check this book out and podcast is the same um it's really just people saying hey i i discovered this cool thing and this is why i like it you should check it out um and then i think it's just a nice way to learn about people and their interest a, a little bit more as well um so if there's a, a book that you've read recently and uh, and a podcast that you might have listened to doesn't have to be about anything that we talked about just something you're like this Tickled my brain. Uh, it was really interesting, and uh, you want people to know about it. Yeah, unfortunately, I, I don't read a lot of books. <laughs> That's <laughs> gotta, fine. Gotta admit. So when I read, I read like tech articles, or like I, I, I'm like interested in like psychology or astrophysics and things like that. Whatever, whatever comes to my mind, I read like articles on that. But I have not nothing nothing special that i can that i can tell you and for the podcast it's also like um to stay a bit ahead with with what what happens in tech i uh, listen to syntax which is like american podcast about like web dev and um this is this is nothing too in depth but um i when i when i drive around in my car i listen to it and and this way i kind of like keep up to date and i i know what's around and i kind of like um know what i should learn where i could have an eye on or or say oh come on no that's nothing for me so it's yeah <laughs> unfortunately that's all i have here no but that's great that's uh that's fine as well um cool I'll uh, I'll check that out. Also have links in the uh, in the show notes. Um, Marcus, thank you so much for your time. This was a great conversation. Thanks for having me. Yeah, I appreciate it. It was really nice to just nerd out about all this stuff. I I just love it. <laughs> Hey, thank you so much for listening to this conversation. I wanted to take a moment to thank the sponsor of this video, but also all the people who financially support me on Patreon. If everything goes well, these conversations should feel and sound seamless and effortless, but there's a lot of work that goes behind the scenes. I try to research and prepare these as much as I can to know who these people are and what makes them interesting and what would lead to a good conversation. I'm incredibly thankful to all the people who support my work on Patreon, meaning I can do a little bit more of it. This podcast started out as a way to learn more about the people in this industry, but I've also started making educational content on another YouTube channel that I'll put a link to in the show notes. And I want to make more content explaining how satellite images and maps work to a broader audience, as well as continuing to research the guests for these podcast episodes. 
So if you value the work that I do, I'd like to ask you to please consider supporting my work on Patreon. There's also some behind the scenes of how this podcast is done and some of the work that I'm doing for these educational videos if you want to learn more about how I do all of this. Either way, thank you so much for all of your attention and your time. I really appreciate it, and I hope you get value from these conversations. Thanks.